Sabrina the Teenage Witch Comic 1971 Issue 1. I'm just gonna call it the Sabrina 70s comic from now on. It's a shame the art is washed out, but hopefully the comic will make up for that. The story starts out with Sabrina telling Ethel from Archie that as long as Harvey and her have been dating, Harvey's never gone out with another girl. She's got pretty low standards if she's bragging about the fact that Harvey hasn't cheated on her. That's silly. Plus, how can any girl know that for a fact and confidently state it? Ethel tells her that that sure looks like Harvey with another girl. I wonder if the comic will be gutsy enough to have it actually be what it looks like. Sabrina is embarrassed and wonders what Harvey's doing. Ethel laughs at her, making fun of her for not knowing Harvey well enough. That's spiteful. But at least it gives her a personality to pay attention to. Which is better than Gina, the bland, nice girl from the 97 comic. But I'd still expect Ethel to be nicer than that. Why is she laughing instead of being bitter when she says sexistly that all men are cheaters? Sabrina recklessly says that she's gonna give Harvey a taste of his own medicine because she can play that game better than him. Of course, if he really was cheating on her and she confronted him on it right now, he would just lie. And he'd be nervous about the accusation whether he was innocent or guilty. So maybe Sabrina knows this, and that's why she thinks it'd be pointless to confront him. So that explains why she doesn't go up to him and get told that she's his cousin right away. She's pretty spiteful in taking a big risk by immediately jumping to the idea of cheating on Harvey when she hasn't even seen objective proof that he cheated on her yet. But I guess it's understandable. But still, she should wait at least. Actually, since she's a witch, shouldn't she spy on Harvey with a crystal ball to see if he's actually cheating on her first? I guess since she only found out she was a witch when she was a teenager, she's not used to it and experienced with it enough that she'd automatically think of every way of being a witch would benefit her. I'd like to point out that at this point, the audience would have had no reason to care about Harvey. The sitcom did a much better job because it didn't start out with her dating Harvey. She had to earn it. After we learned that he had a crush on her as well. The show changed the status quo a little and gave her a major victory because we got to see how they started dating. And we saw how they first met the first time we saw Harvey. We were given the time to get to know Harvey first. He was a really nice football player with a jerk father. And he also knew how to be a car mechanic with a bunch of guys. But here, for all we know right now, Harvey's just a cheater. I wish I could show images from the show to demonstrate my point. But that'd be a lot of work and take forever, even if I could find footage of the show on the internet. I have the DVDs, but it'd take forever to load it up and take a picture of the TV. Anyways, Sabrina says that she plans to spite Harvey by cheating on with Archie. That's a stupid idea because she should know that he's already in a relationship with two different girls who've been competing for his affection his whole life. So they're gonna get mad at Sabrina. But of course if she's able to brainwash him into being infatuated with her, that won't matter. And she can brainwash Betty and Veronica into not being mad at her as well. She's definitely an anti-hero right away, if not an outright villain. I'm only saying hero so far because she's the protagonist, and I'm already familiar with the fact that Sabrina's normally a well-intentioned person. If this was the Sabrina from the show, she'd probably just be sad and upset that Harvey was cheating on her. I doubt she'd immediately plan on cheating on him. Not after it took her months to try to get over him breaking up with her. All Sabrina has to do is point at Archie, and when she asks him seductively to buy her a coke, he thanks her multiple times and walks behind her kissing her hand. In the 97 comic, Sabrina tried to brainwash Brad into loving her as one of her first spells, but it was impossible. But then she could zap up a love perfume just fine. So I guess that witch code restriction was retconned away. Which makes no sense because of this unfortunate implication right here. If witches could do this that easily whenever they want, then every unscrupulous witch would gladly take advantage of it. It's not like every witch would, because most of them would feel guilty and uncomfortable with it, and want someone to love them because they earned it, but still. This type of spell... You'd think it'd be made, if not impossible, from the combined magic of the Witches' Council and chanting it away from everyone? It'd still be made illegal. And that law would be enforced by the spy which is spy on every witch whenever they're around a mortal. Because this kind of spell is kind of worse than an outright rupee. It even humiliates Archie. I'm not mad at the story, of course. This is fascinating. It's even humorous. Archie says, For you, Sabrina, my love, I would cross a burning desert. I would climb the highest mountain. Your wish will be my command. The Witches' Council would have been pressured into outlawing love spells a long time ago from the entire general public because they'd be terrified of that spell being cast on them. 
because it'd be cast on them by any random stranger on the street. And the members of the Witches' Council themselves would want to outlaw it for their own protection. But it looks like the spell wasn't made impossible, which I guess makes sense. Maybe the reason it's kept possible is so that spy witches could catch anyone unscrupulous enough to cast the spell for the wrong reason. So they could punish them for failing to test the character right away before anything really bad could happen. So that's why witches don't use the spell. I guess the reason she'll get away with this is that any witch spy on her and their mandatory job to keep the witches in line among mortals would have heard her say why she's doing this first. So she's not going to get punished because she only wants to use Archie really temporarily to get Harvey jealous and want her more. She doesn't actually want to be with Archie. So all she's doing is temporarily embarrassing him. And he's enjoying himself at the moment, so it's not that bad. It's nice of Sabrina to say that a coke will be sufficient. Though it's weird of a teenager to say sufficient instead of enough. But still, she could take advantage of him a lot worse than this, and that would be more morally shady. She's just a naive teenage girl who doesn't really think things all the way through. Ethel runs away, saying that she's going to tell her friend about what just happened, which will embarrass Archie. And despite all my childhood experiences reading his comic, I don't mind at all. In fact, I'm loving this. Probably because I got sick of him wasting my time with not just choosing a girl already and gave up his comic for market fatigue. A prime example of why shipping could ruin a series. He gives Sabrina a coke and politely hopes that it didn't take too long. Right in front of Harvey. I love that this comic's allowed to just say coke. If this was Sonic, they wouldn't be allowed to use any brand names and have to dance around them, and that'd be lame. But this takes place in a world really similar to Earth, so it'd be especially dumb to not use the brand names. He puts his arm around Sabrina as she smirks and asks if she wants anything else and if she's comfy, calling her sweet, just like Scourge called Fiona without even needing a love spell first. Archie sits on the table in front of the guy in charge of the place, who's probably just jealous. Or knows that Archie has a girlfriend. Ethel shows Veronica what happened, saying that she wasn't lying. I grew up with Sabrina's comics and Archie comics, so I don't mind seeing Archie characters in a series. In fact, I'm nostalgic about it. Veronica tells Archie that she was waiting on a cold street corner for him. I wanted to mention it earlier, but why were these teenagers doing so much walking instead of driving? I guess they really want the exercise. Why else would they be on the sidewalk in the first place? Not even a bike? It's kind of weird that Sabrina's first issue doesn't show off the high school that'll be the main setting, or even her house, at least so far. Why is Archie calling Veronica Ronnie? Oh, don't tell me that's another unintuitive short form for a name. Archie tells her nervously not to raise her voice or she'll hurt Sabrina's ears. Sabrina's naturally intimidated, but she somehow avoids the consequences because Veronica shakes Archie by the shirt instead of her, preferring to mistreat her childhood friend and sweetheart instead of the girl he was cheating on her with. Well, that's lucky. Veronica asks him if he's trying to make a fool out of her, which would be the more logical explanation, as fortunately the guy behind the counter looks scared, and Archie tells Sabrina not to listen because she's just jealous of their love. Sabrina wisely unzaps the spell, being moral enough to do that instead of just brainwashing Veronica into not wanting to bother them. And then Archie asks what Veronica's doing here and what he's doing here, as Sabrina was smart enough to include our memory erasing in the spell. Veronica walks away, complaining that her father was right about Archie being an idiot. I guess she doesn't believe him. Fortunately, Sabrina finally shows the audience that she has a conscience and is a likable protagonist because she feels sorry for Archie. It makes Veronica forget what happened too. Uh, what about everyone else who witnessed it? Who could easily just remind them of what happened anyways? Harvey asks what's going on, and Sabrina says that it's all his fault and she's considering never talking to him again. And of course, the girl is his cousin. This must be a cliché, because I immediately predicted it. He even brought her here to meet her. Maybe it would have been smarter of him to... bring her to Sabrina's house. It's too bad he was too dumb to think of that. See, this is a problem that wouldn't have happened if these two had gotten to know each other as much as they should have, considering that they're dating. I'd imagine that a boyfriend and girlfriend would show each other their family photo albums at some point. To have something more to talk about and get to know each other better. Instead of only talking about school. But I guess that's not realistic. Maybe she'd have forgotten what his cousin looked like anyways. It's also a problem that wouldn't have happened if cell phones were a thing back then. Even then, weren't there telephones back then? I'm pretty sure Harvey could have called her on his home phone and said, Hey, I've got my female cousin coming over. I'm going to introduce her to you. Sabrina hugs Harvey and says she should have known she could trust him. And asks if he'd ever forgive her. 
being humble enough to admit she was wrong right away instead of staying mad. And he immediately forgives her instead of being mad at her, creating a drama about how she doesn't trust him enough. This is nice. That's a good relationship. The story ends with Ethel lampshading that love works in strange ways. Because Sabrina didn't bother to erase her memory. I don't feel like talking about the gigantic amount of non-Sabrina stories after this. I'm reminded of early Sonic the comic here. Why was so much valuable comic space wasted on stories that should be in their own comics? It's called the Sabrina the Teenage Witch comic. It's not like it's the Archie comic. Well, I found Open House for Monsters interesting. Not only is it because they're monsters, but they act like regular people. Like, even a bat. But also because of what happens in it. This guy named Igor, it seems like his whole job is that he's a psychiatrist for monsters. Monsters go to him with their problems, and he gives them advice. So, even though there's Dracula, he's actually humanized. Like, it's nothing. Because he goes to him with problems about his girlfriend. That's creative. And he gets some fits of frenzy for some reason. And, and they always happened when he's having a meal that his girlfriend gave him. And it makes me feel sorry for him. Like, I hope she doesn't break up with him. He's asked what he usually has to eat, and he complains that it's always the same. Steak and potatoes. At first I thought that the problem was obviously that he hated having to eat the same meal every day. But apparently that would be too intuitive. And instead, his problem is that when he hears steak, he thinks of a steak. Like the kind that hurts vampires. So it freaks him out. So when he realizes what's going on, he thanks him for telling him. Oh good, there's another Sabrina story. Some guy calls Sabrina a kitten on a motorcycle and she recognizes him immediately. Asking what the Sylvester is doing here because she thought he went back to college. Well this is interesting, but it's also annoying because she knows who he is when I don't. He says that he couldn't keep his mind on the knowledge scene knowing that he freaked out on his own family. He got a leave of absence to help Aunt Hilda with the new witch movement. Ooh, that's exciting. Does it involve Salem? Sabrina asks him if he's still on that kick, and he says it's a way of life. So, is he supposed to be a hippie? Oh, the peace sign necklace. Other than that, and the long hair which I thought was just a part of his biker role, I guess he didn't look nearly exaggerated enough for me to tell. He insults Sabrina, saying that if she's not a hippie, she's from nowhere. Sabrina's nice enough to admit that he may be right, but says that her aunts are happy with the way things are. He asks who could be happy back in the Dark Ages. He says he's counting on her to make her aunts see the light, because her aunts like her, while he comes on too strong. It's nice of Sabrina to say that she'll do what she can, and it's a good thing that we're seeing her house in the first issue after all. It was idiotic of Sylvester to immediately give Sabrina hippie clothes. He just said that he comes on too strong. What do you think was the problem? I guess she just totally buys the excuse that you can't tell people to get with it if you're not with it yourself. Because she doesn't immediately return her clothes to normal with magic. So that idiotic mistake of hers embarrasses her right away. Hilda asks where her shoes are, and says that it'd be disgraceful of her to go out looking like that. But I like those pants. Hopefully in this comic, the ants will actually contrast each other and have separate personalities this time. Then Sylvester shows up right away. When he just said that he came on too strong and was leading it to Sabrina, so he immediately sabotaged his own plan. But it was probably because of compassion because he told her to lay it on him. So he just felt sorry for Sabrina and didn't want her to be in trouble anymore. Why does he waste time calling himself her favorite cool cat nephew if he should know that she hates him? He just made an idiot of himself. Hilda smacks him with a broom. Or I guess she missed because he's used to it and predicted it. She lampshades that she should have known he had something to do with this, and she thought that she sent him back to Salem University. He's got stars around his head, so I guess she did hit him with that broom. You can tell she's from an older time if she thinks that's acceptable. She tells him that the only movement she wants from him is to get himself back to campus. It's nice of Sabrina to tell Hilda to hear him out and say that he's only trying to help her because he loves her. Surprisingly, Hilda's pleasantly surprised to hear this. Why would she be surprised when that's her nephew? And why would she be pleased if she's long since decided that she hates him? I guess this was only written to demonstrate that she's not supposed to be the bad guy and she's actually got a heart. She immediately decides to humor him and tells him not to change her house around. He tells Hilda that the magic cats of today don't go around scaring people in Halloween suits and flying on brooms. 
That's from the old establishment. Won't only an extreme minority of witches still be like that on Earth? Won't every witch scaring people get punished for it by the witches' council after being caught? Because they don't want to get caught? Or else all the witches will be known about? How would he be the minority? A football crashes through Hilda's window because it has the weakest glass ever, and she talks as if witches aren't humans too, when they clearly are. She complains, relatably, saying that she's told those mortals not to play ball around here. And she wants to teach them a lesson they won't forget by conjuring a monster. But how does she expect them to remember that lesson? And make there be a point to her teaching them it? Shouldn't she know that every instance of magic around mortals gets erased from mortal memory? Which is the only way the masquerade around magic would be kept around? Maybe she's just speaking metaphorically and knows they'll forget it. And just hoping that they'll feel too scared to play ball near her house after this. But won't remember why. It'll just feel familiar to them the idea that they shouldn't play ball around her house. So Sylvester is established to be the good guy here. When I thought he was just gonna get made fun of over and over. That's unique. He tells her not to lose her cool as I wonder why Sabrina hasn't been telling her she shouldn't abuse her magic like this. For as long as she's known she had powers and she's a good person. How's it just him? Won't you feel sorry for those kids? He tells Hilda to let him handle the scene and show her the ways of the new witches. He says that treating mortals with love and kindness is the only way. And Hilda's relatable when she says that they still broke her window. He tells the kids outside that he'll give them the ball back and not yell at them and make them pay for the window. They should pay for the window, but it is sweet to see him give them all candy. One of the kids thanks him and calls him Mr. Blightly and leaves. He didn't exactly make a good point to Hilda. Then some kids throw rocks through the window, with Hilda humorously assuming that they're flying meteorites from outer space despite the angle they were thrown out. And realistically, it happened because these kids' friends told them that if they broke their windows, some idiot would give them some candy. I'm glad the story showed that he was wrong too. Hilda says that she hasn't gotten that many windows left. Never mind that she could just zap the windows back to normal. I get why it annoy her, because she'd still have to zap them back to normal. So she summons a monster, and that immediately teaches the kids to not come back, implying that she was right all along. It's kind of weird that the main character, Sabrina, barely got to talk in the story. And I'm not sure if Zelda even talked at all. But I guess it's okay because the story was about establishing Hilda's character instead. And thankfully, she was the only one acting like that. So that implies that she has a separate personality from Zelda. It's a shame so much comic space is wasted after this. I guess I'd rather be wasted on stuff I'd want to completely skip than have the Sonic situation where the stories themselves have boring padding to artificially fill up all the comic space. In The Sampler, Hilda puts some freshly baked cookies in a cookie jar. And when Harvey tries to take some, she uses magic to catch his hand in a mouse trap, Which is mean, but understandable. It'd be nice if we saw Sabrina zap up cookies for him after that. Good, there's a third story. Harvey stupidly says he can take a tray from Hilda that has a jar of liquid on it. And he refuses to listen to her and ends up spilling it on Sabrina. I guess it's not going to be just milk and instead a potion she made. I love seeing Hilda in a new outfit. She's dressed in the most stereotypical black witch outfit, which is less creative, but more iconic. A lot of people dress strangely. And mortals don't believe in witches, so it's not totally unbelievable that Hilda and Zelda dressing like witches doesn't act as a dead giveaway. People just assume they really like those outfits for some reason. It's easier for mortals to believe that than believe they're literally witches. Fortunately, Harvey apologizes, and says he'll get her some water in her claw so she could clean her dress before it's stained. Hilda snarks that he could trip over an elephant, implying that he's supposed to be clumsy in general. At least that's unique. He runs while carrying a bowl of water and ends up running into something on the floor and spilling the soapy water on Hilda. How is he this stupid? He apologizes as to wonder why that thing he tripped on was there, right in front of the entrance to the kitchen. Hilda calls him an idiot and doesn't know what Sabrina sees in someone who's nothing but trouble. It's interesting to see Hilda disapprove of her dating Harvey. She says for some reason that if she turned Harvey into a baboon, he'd look way better. So is he actually intended to be unattractive? In which case it's more confusing that Sabrina wants to date him? Or is Hilda just saying this because she's used to an older, outdated standard of masculine beauty? So maybe it's because she doesn't have facial hair. She tells Hilda to calm down and then recklessly decides to leave her alone with Harvey after that. And she asks Harvey to mop up the mess he made. Hilda thinks he'll trip over the mop next. There's fortunately a subversion, as he ends up swatting her face with the mop instead. 
In back of me? I've never seen that phrase before. Hilda definitely has more of a temper than the sitcom, that's for sure. But it shows how much she cares about Sabrina that she doesn't use her magic on Harvey after this and just runs out of the room yelling instead. Harvey marks that she's strange, when this isn't that strange compared to everything else. He says that he better get rid of this mop and get a dustpan. At least it makes him sympathetic. I feel bad for him. But you probably don't want to have the establishing character moment for the main character's boyfriend be one where you just wonder why she's in love with him. Then a guy with black hair who knows Hilda walks into the house with a gorilla he bought for her. He recklessly trusts him alone in her living room and goes to look for Hilda. What made him think this is a good idea, or even necessary? He could have easily brought Oscar with him. Then Sabrina once predictably assumed that Hilda turned Harvey into this. She uses magic to turn the gorilla into Harvey, and then it turns out the name of this black-haired guy is Ambrose. Ooh, he's in both comics. He looks like a middle-aged man here. So it's interesting that the newer comic had a creative interpretation of him. I think he looks too different than the 90s comic. It's not memorable that he's called Ambrose in the 90s comic because he doesn't look like this guy at all. Hilda's happy to be told she's been given a gift, and Ambrose justifies they just want to give her some much needed companionship. She then screams at seeing Harvey and asks if this is a joke, and says that everyone's plotting against her. She's entertaining, definitely more so than the later comic. Maybe people didn't like the ants as much in that one because of this. Ambrose tells Hilda that she didn't see his actual gift. And then Harvey sees Oscar, and looks like an idiot saying that he looks familiar instead of immediately recognizing him as himself and freaking out. Ambrose walks into the room while lampshading that Hilda shouldn't have thought he'd give her Harvey as a pet. She screams at seeing two Harveys and hides behind the couch. Ambrose says that maybe Sabrina can explain things because somehow one of the Harveys has his chimp collar on for some reason. I love this. This is the kind of plot and misunderstanding that only witches could give you. Sabrina returns the chimp to normal, with Harvey naturally asking where the guy went and where the chimp came from. Hilda says that the monkey reminds her too much of Harvey, and Harvey ends the story lampshading that this is a weird house. This is definitely a in media res start to the Sabrina comic. The first story was about Sabrina assuming Harvey was cheating on her and brainwashing Archie into being infatuated with her to make him jealous, only to find out that, of course, it was just Harvey's cousin. It was interesting and humorous to see her do that. I guess if I said that every story was interesting, it'd be repetitive. So just assume that's the case from now on. I definitely like this comic. Of course, it was morally shady for her to embarrass him like that, but she could have been a lot worse. She only wanted to do that for a little bit. She didn't actually want him to be her boyfriend. The second story is about showing Hilda's character. As a relative of Sabrina's, tries to show the audience that the newer witches are good, while well, Hilda hates mortals, so she's fine with conjuring up a monster to scare away the kids who broke a window. And it turns out that she's right sometimes and he's wrong when he gives them candy and they try to get more. You'd think they would simply ask for candy. It was smart of the writing to show that Sylvester isn't always right and there's a flaw in his philosophy of always being nice to mortals. So the writing's a bit more complex and nuanced than that. And the third story is about Harvey's clumsiness annoying Hilda. And because she threatened to turn him into a baboon earlier, Sabrina assumes that the chimp pet that Ambrose gave Hilda for some reason is actually Harvey, the kind of plot that I feel I could only see in a series like this. So that's a great way to take advantage of the comic's premise. Though it is a shame that there's so little magic being cast in each story, which doesn't take advantage of the premise. The first issue of the 97 comic and Sabrina cast tons of spells at once. But here, Sabrina casted one spell for the first story, no spells for the second, with Hilda casting one. It's weird that the first issue doesn't do enough to establish that Sabrina's supposed to be a good witch. There are two times in the third story where someone stupidly left someone alone for no reason to disastrous consequences. And while we saw Sabrina's house as a main setting, you'd think we would see a lot more of the high school because she's supposed to be a teenage witch. Aside from the art being faded, which is pretty distracting, I think I like this comic better. If only because Hilda's got such an impression on me. It seems more interesting as a result. Hilda and Zelda's designs are more iconic this way. Zelda didn't even talk, and Salem's completely absent, but Hilda's definitely memorable. 